Greetings, sir and sirettes, and welcome back to From the Depths with me, Lathrix. And of course, welcome to a very brief demonstration, currently in the sandbox mode before we get into the campaign. Now don't worry, as soon as I've done this, we are finally getting back into the campaign, and we are making a push against the Onyx Watch. But this is just to answer a lot of people who are asking the same question. Why don't I just use the Gravity? Graviton Ram when using advanced cannon shells. For those who don't know, the Graviton Ram is essentially a segment of the shell customizer in which the more kinetic damage the shell does, the more force is then applied to the enemy. It removes the kinetic damage to apply physical force, which can move the enemy, which of course can cause enemies to flip over, can cause them to spin, it can cause all sorts of chaos. And the reason why I don't use it is because right now it's ridiculous ridiculously powerful to such an extent it bra it basically breaks the game so here we are with my Abaddon versus the Abaddon test subject which has an additional AI segment on the bottom rather than the top and here we are testing out the Graviton Ram and there goes the Abaddon as you can see <laughs> it's a little bit ridiculous. And bear in mind, this is the Abaddon. It has a lot of heavy armor. It's a very, very heavy vehicle. <laughs> so that is why I don't currently use the Graviton Ram. Certainly an interesting thing to use, but it's just absolutely broken. Even by my standards as someone who loves using missiles despite their inherent rather powerful nature, I just can't bring myself to use Graviton Rams. It's absolutely ridiculous. Let's spawn in a Chaos very briefly. Let's, okay, let's allow it to shoot the missiles, then once the missiles are gone, we're going to fire at it. Most likely the first few shells are going to be deflected by the shields. But I just want to showcase how powerful the ram is, even against a very heavy opponent such as the Chaos. And there goes the Chaos. Yep, there it goes, sliding away on its back a few, a few hundred, a few thousand meters away at this point, after just a couple of hits. It's very cool, I'll definitely say that, it's certainly Goodbye. It's certainly a very interesting shell type, but I just can't bring myself to use them. Even the smaller variants can actually be incredibly powerful. And it's gone. So with that, let's get back into the campaign and let's see how far we can go into the Onyx Watch's territory using a few of our new vehicles. The first of the elite craft to be spawned into the campaign, we now have the Carnage currently here simply fueling up. As soon as it gets to maximum resource, which there's not much left after making this thing, we're going to send it against the Onyx Watch, purely because this is going to hard counter the Onyx Watch. There is no chance they're going to hit this thing, and if they do, the shields are powerful enough to even deflect cram cannons. This may single-handedly defeat the Onyx Watch in a matter of hours, and I'm really hoping that's actually going to be the case. As much as I have adored this campaign, easily my favourite campaign of everything I've played so far in From the Depths, it's time to move on to a new one, and so the era of the Elite Craft is here. The melee vehicle is going to go down to help with the White Flyers, the Cram Cannon Artillery Tank will probably also be going towards the White Flyers, although it's going to be have to it's going to have to be kept away from the melee vehicle, because otherwise it's going to hit it over and over again. So we are going to have to have two separate groups going south. We're going to have a couple of the Carnage jets go north together and we're going to see if I can make them work well in a in a small squadron. If they can, then that's very bad news for the Onyx Watch. And there it goes, the Carnage is now airborne. So for the first time, our craft is actually going to be more expensive than the Onyx Watch we are fighting, which is going to be very, very weird. So although this is going to be a very powerful craft, its fire rate and overall fire power is quite low. All of its strength comes in the fact it's fairly quick, it has strong shields, and it is completely made out of layered heavy armor. 
it's going to be very hard to kill, essentially. It's just not going to do all that much damage. I'm feeling particularly cruel, so rather than using only a single Carnage in our first test, we are using two of them, and one of them has been retrofitted to use rapid fire missiles rather than using the cruise missiles. The overall damage output will very likely be similar, but this is going to be a much more consistent source of damage, and will also probably look far, far cooler. So this one here, this Carnage I'm currently sitting on, which is far too stable, which looks really weird for an aircraft, has 11 missiles per wing for a grand total of 22 missiles, so it should be able to do quite a bit of damage. Now in this group we have 3 Krull, because that's what we had available, and we have 1 Bloodletter, once again because that's simply what we had available at the time. So a lot of long range weaponry, a lot of missiles, it should be incredibly effective versus the Onyx Watch. Also, I am going to work very soon on converting the Bloodletter into a more tanky craft, or converting one of the Abaddon into a minigun variant, because as much as I love the Bloodletter, I always feel a little bit scared using it now. They tend to die a little bit too easily, even if they do tend to kill everything they look at first. So, I'll be back in a second with our first battle. Well, this is definitely going to be a very interesting first battle for the Carnage. So, against us is the Rhino. Now, the Rhino is a 11,000 volume enemy, which is far bigger than the Chaos or the Beholder from the White Flyers. And this is because this is one of their resource zones. It turns out, in a previous episode, and I had to go back and look up the footage just to make sure this actually happened, I had accidentally grabbed the group from this tile and brought it down to attack us. What I thought had happened was just the Onyx Watch were sending out a second attack party, straight after another one. What actually happened was my satellite just clipped this line here, and so they were defending themselves and sending that force down. On the upside, that means now we just simply ran right over the river and straight into their resource zone. Not really what I expected for the first battle, but still going to be very interesting. So there's a cannon tower, the Rhino, and then something else here. There is also a different force, or at least I'm somewhat certain there is, as you can see here. Add this fleet to the list of fleets you're attacking. I feel like that would be really silly to do because I don't know how powerful the Rhino is, even if the Onyx Watch so far have been a rather disappointing faction to fight. They look awesome, they've got awesome style, but they're definitely meant to be the second faction you fight. We kind of skipped them and went for the more difficult faction straight away. Even with that, I do want to fight this one-on-one -on -one just to see what it's like, so let's get into the battle and set up the AI and we'll get straight into the fight footage. Okay, all of the AI has been set up, and look at this thing! This is the Rhino! This is the enemy little mini fortification vehicle thing, which is defending the resource zone, and isn't it awesome looking? So much armor, so many cannons, even some heavy armor. This is actually probably going to take quite a beating. The only thing I can think which is going to be quite a negative towards this tank, is that the advanced cannons, which are apparently shooting explosive rounds, and the top of the regular cannons are quite exposed, only a thin layer of metal, so if the missiles hit them, it's probably going to detonate. I also love how they've done this. This is all exhaust systems. It just looks really cool. It sort of looks like a microchip, to be honest, just really, really awesome. I do adore the Onyx Watch, at least in terms of style. And then we have the cannon towers, which are, yep, definitely a cannon tower. That's a cannon, it's attached to a tower. Nothing really much more to say. Also, there's this weird thing here. I don't really know what's going on there. I'm going to do my best to ignore it. Just make sure I'm not attached to a vehicle. Okay, there go the rapid fire missile. Did you just kill yourself? There are the shots from the blood letter. How did you do that? It didn't have a failsafe, it just shot itself. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> well, who needs to fight the enemy when it shoots itself in the arse? I'm actually... 
No, was that? No, that wasn't the bloodlet. Yeah, look, there it goes again! Well, there go the rapid-fire missiles. Not really doing all that much. Here comes the carnage. Let's test out its tankiness. Again hitting itself! How are you doing this? Oh, a deflection there from the carnage. And that is why we add shields. The Rhino just completely annihilated itself. It took so much damage at the start there. It was already airborne before the missiles hit. And they're going underneath as well, ignoring all of that heavy armor. Oh, that was a mess. That was an absolute mess. The Rhino has been destroyed in what may be one of the most disappointing fights I've done in a long time. <laughs> I'm really sad about that. Oh, I was so looking forward to this really tanky vehicle fighting us. The blood letter there, absolutely obliterating that cannon. The missiles from the Krull attacking that, and I think we are done. I'm going to have to look back at that footage. I need to see that again. Before we get into the second fight, which apparently is right next to it, which is actually a really big group. And there it is. Okay, so this is the Rhino, which has been spawned in into the sandbox mode on my side. And I was just doing a little bit of testing to figure out exactly what just happened. So all of these weapons do actually have failsafes, which I was very surprised by after looking back at the previous bit of footage. Because at least two of the four explosions, which I said were definitely friendly fire were friendly fire. One of them, though, I'm fairly certain was actually from the blood letter. Either way, though, I think this is just a classic case of From the Depth still being a game in development which can sometimes cause problems. And what's happened is, when these barrels go through the blocks, like this one through here, this one through here, occasionally the failsafe doesn't detect the block the barrel is actually in. And because of this, it does, well, that. And this has happened now somewhat consistently. I keep on repairing it, it keeps on hurting itself. The one at the front, however, I believe that explosion happened because this barrel was destroyed. So then the weapon itself fired and it fired really in inaccurately and simply hit something nearby. But by doing this, because these are very, very explosive turrets and they are very, very explosive things, it pretty much blew out the entire inside of, of the tank. So a real shame there, an absolute shame, because just a look at this thing. It's absolutely terrifying. Each of these weapons is good, even the smaller cram cannons are very powerful, the advanced cannons are very well made, and honestly, if it wasn't for that random moment of silliness, and there again, as you just saw, a small explosion here because of that clipping, it's all hurt itself again, it would have been an absolutely fantastic fight. So I don't blame the design here. I think it was just a fluke of From the Depths, just a bit of bad luck, which is a real shame. A really good tank, looks awesome in our colours, I have to say, and maybe I'll do some testing against this in the future so that we can test just how powerful this tank really is. I can't get over how disappointed I am right now. Well... Back into the game, and let's have that huge fight I was just promising. And there, look at that, just eating away its own armor. Very, very loudly as well. And again, all of these weapons have failsafes, every last one of them. After more testing, I think I can shed some more light on where some of the explosions came from. And don't worry, this will be the last time in sandbox mode now for the episode. But this cannon has now obliterated one of the front cannons. In fact, it caused a massive internal explosion. Not quite as big as the first one we saw in the clip actually in the campaign, but that would explain a lot of the problems. The side cannons are killing it. Okay, back to the campaign. Okay, then let's just get straight into this battle. There's a whole series of Onyx Watch vehicles. We have the Carnage on both sides, and of course I've spawned in first to make sure the land doesn't glitch out. That of course could have been part of the problem in the last fight, so let's make sure that doesn't happen again. Begin the battle. Everything should be in combat mode already this time. Fantastic! And let's get started. 
There's the swarm missiles coming- no, that's the cruise missiles coming from that carnage, and there's the swarm missiles coming from that one. The swarm really seemed to be quite ineffective. The carnage seems to do far better. The blood letter seems to just do far better than both of them. As much as missiles are fantastic, the blood letters cannon is a lot better, and wait a second. The Onyx Watch apparently have miniguns and have actually done quite a bit of damage versus the blood letter. Look at that, it's already been grounded and the inside is completely exposed. What shells are they? I don't know. I think that. Is that a single fragment warhead? Let's have a look see. Yeah, it's. Well, definitely frag warheads. I don't know how many. It looks like one. The blood letter shots have three, just for reference, and of course are being shot far faster than that. Even so, though, the blood letter has been taken out. Both Carnage are just raining hell upon the enemy. Some of them are trying to focus on the Carnage, and that is massively causing them problems since they're just never going to be able to hit them. Face the wrath of boring hard counter. And I do apologize to those who hate that, but. Right now, we are finishing the campaign, and so we are bullying the enemy. Even if they did kill the Bloodletter. Okay, will this hit the Carnage? I'm actually hoping some of them will, although we have seen the shields be incredibly effective. It would be nice to have some more experiences of taking damage. I will be spawning in the Cram Cannon tank and the Melee tank very soon though, so don't worry, it won't just be missiles today. Although the new missile look is really awesome, with the with the um, flare behind it, it looks really cool. And of course, the new smoke effects. Yeah, I'm going to say the swarm missiles, although very cool, are not as effective as the crews. Having one shot, which does a lot of damage, seems to be better than lots of little shots. As we can see there. Take that, easy faction! And a complete miss. They can just not handle flyers. We are being very mean. Swarm missiles going in, doing a little bit of damage there. Then, then the cruise missiles to show it how it's done. One of them going all the way through. I think this carnage is a little bit too low in the air. I, I may have already mentioned that earlier, but I really do think that is the case. It may end up getting hit just by being so close to the enemy. And there we are, victory via a million little explosive cuts. So we now have control of this resource zone, the enemy are now going to be much slower at reinforcing themselves, so now we can focus on the south. What I'm going to do- oh, hello. Okay, you guys are coming back because apparently we're being attacked by the White Flyers. Well, time to test out the Chaos, sorry, the Carnage versus the Chaos. And we're going to spawn in either the Melee Vehicle or the Cram Vehicle, and that is going to go against the White Flyers to showcase either Cram Weaponry or Melee Weaponry. Like I said, it's not all going to be missiles today. The Melee Vehicle is now being spawned in, and so we are going to release the name. So the Melee is now going to be called the Bloodthirster. There we are, the Bloodthirster. A pretty straightforward name and a very straightforward meaning. This is also one of the greater demons of corn, so I think it's very, very fitting. They're also, hello Bloodletter, they're also the Melee Specialists of the Legion. Again, complete sense. Time to see if the Chaos, the Priest, and the Forsaken can deal with Flyers at all. I really don't think they can, and that's why I'm not using the Carnage against the White Flyers usually. They simply have came up against our force. I'm not quite sure why they ignored the base, and they ignored the group with the Abaddon down south, but for some reason, they ignored everything and went all the way up to here, 
and then were going to turn around and start attacking us over here. Not quite sure why that happened, but apparently it did. Now before I start, I should just showcase something in the options, because people were asking me, how do I get the new particle effects for the missiles and the flares and make it all look really pretty, because sometimes it doesn't quite look like that. And it's not in campaign options, it's in... Gameplay and detail, there we are. It's simply the particle factor needs to be at maximum, and if you go into video, you can put that on maximum as well. And then once again in here, if you go to the missile trail length and put it that to maximum, it makes the missiles look far, far better, at least in my opinion. So, that's just that out of the way. Let's get into this fight. And let's see how it goes. I feel like they'll probably kill the Krull, since they have nothing else defending them. Oh, they do have missiles. We do have flares, though. I forgot they had missiles. Maybe they'll do better than expected. Oh, the carnage is absolutely brutalizing that Forsaken. I completely forgot the Chaos had missiles. Missiles from the Krull hitting the back a little bit, hopefully slowing it down. These swarm missiles being released from the carnage going for both of them, actually. There's also a very small chance that the Chaos will end up in the water. Like our Krull, for instance. Please go for that Krull. End up in the water, I beg of you. Missiles doing absolutely nothing versus the Chaos, as we've seen time and time again. The enemy priest is being defeated, though. Ah, oh, darn it, ignoring it. It is trying to fire its cannon, but I can't imagine that's going to hit. The enemy priest has finally been taken down by the two carnage. Again, a lot of missiles hitting the back. The chaos is such a work of art, it really is. It's so difficult to kill. When you compare this to the Onyx Watch, you can really tell that the Onyx that the Onyx Watch is balanced around being an early faction, not a light faction. Oh, just look at that for a second. For people who, like me who love missiles, that is absolutely wonderful. They need to be more agile though, with the Chaos moving around like it is. Oh, the Chaos is going to go into the water and there it goes. That may be a problem, honestly, because if that goes underwater, we won't be able to actually detect it. I only have very simple detection systems on the Carnage since they fire missiles with their own detection system. If we can take it below 80% health, it will count as sinking soon. Um... Well then, I guess I could try to turn the missiles into torpedoes. Because this may take a while now. The carnage proving to be just absolutely amazing though. It did take a few missiles, just absolutely shrugged them off. Their own missiles seem to work absolutely fine. They're hard to hit, they're quick, they're tanky, they have shields. I'm really happy with the carnage even if it does feel a bit overpowered. The underwater chaos here. Um, okay, probably going to start cutting footage now because this is going to take quite some time. I'm just burning through material just having this fight. Oh, incoming missiles from the chaos, which then go after the flares. If that cannon actually hits, I'll be amazed. I'm actually hoping it does now. Come on, hit me with the cannon. You can do it! I believe in you! The Chaos has finally resurfaced! I was just converting these missiles into torpedoes when finally it is once again showing itself and we are really showcasing the weakness of missiles. I keep on saying this but it is very true, although missiles can be incredibly effective, they're not always. They do have massive limitations. Oh look, it's one of the torpedoes which may actually hit the target? Okay, let's leave one side as torpedoes until we've hit it at least once. They just don't do all that much damage per hit. In comparison to the Bloodletters cannon or the Cram cannons, they're definitely weaker. 
There we are. One torpedo hitting the target. He's just taking hit after hit after hit. Where is it? Where is the chaos? The chaos is over there. You can do it, Chaos! I believe in you! There we are! You've, you've got out! You are victorious. As soon as I fly past, though, I think... I think it isn't unfair to try and capture that vehicle right now. It's lost all of its weaponry. It's about to go underwater again. It's going to die eventually. We've won this fight. And now it's taking an absolute peppering of missile after missile after missile. If all of the enemies were like the chaos, I don't think I'd I don't think I would ever use missiles. Just ever. No! Not now. Oh, poop. Well, apparently it was damaged in enemy territory and that killed it. I don't even know what you actually have to be in terms of health percentage for that to get set off. Well, no chaos for us, lads. If we did capture it, of course, we, we wouldn't have been able to heal it anyway, but I was going to use it as a resource gatherer over there, which, of course, we still need one. What I might do is convert some of the crawls into resource gatherers just for now to start getting that resource. I think that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so you guys get back up here. Satellite, go over here so we can find out where the on Onyx Watch are actually coming from. And down here... Is the melee vehicle done yet? Yes, it is. No, it's not. That's the blood letter. There's the melee. How you doing, buddy? What on earth is that? Did I add a smoke dispenser? I cannot remember adding that. Apparently I did. I mustn't have turned it on. Control... Make sure we're not on the weapon. There we are. Automatic control block, spin blocks, just fast forward, go. Look at that. That easily has to be one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So this is taking a leaf out of the Chaos's book, which actually has one of the smoke dispensers set to fire mode whenever the spin block starts spinning. I thought, why don't we do that, but with smoke for the bloodthirster? And there we are. And that looks so, so cool. Definitely keeping that. Before we get into a battle using the melee bloodthirster, I've just found the Onyx Watch stronghold of the Treadstone. It's in the northeast of the map, so that is our goal for the next episode. One final battle to test out the Bloodthirster against a small group of white flyers who were on their way to attack our main base. So we have intercepted them with the force already down here and simply added the Bloodthirster as a bit of a test. And apparently that's a lot of friendly fire on the part of the white flyers. If we can get one melee kill, I will be so happy. Yes, yes, and there we go, going straight through that back vehicle. I have no idea what that vehicle was called. We're simply calling it the back vehicle now, apparently. Oh, taking a cram cannon shot to our cram cannon, which is a very weird thing to happen. Going against the enemy Ravager and ravaging it. Now that was very effective. Just the enemy flyer now still alive, which is being peppered with missiles and advanced cannon shots, and down it goes. Also, I do love the smoke effect. It's a bit over the top. I think we do need to dial it down, but when it's spinning, it looks amazing. Also, I think I've done something wrong with my, with my automatic control block, because that never seems to work properly. Well, it does seem to work properly sometimes, but not always. I think something's overriding it, so that it's not always going back to its normal positioning. 
And actually, I think I know what it is. I think what I've done, I have two control blocks. One of them puts the weapon back to its original position. The other one stops it from rotating. What I think is happening is that the one which puts it back in the original position goes off first, and then the rotation stopper goes off, thus stopping it in its tracks. I think what I need to do is have one of them on a delay. Then that way it'll work absolutely fine. Like have the rotation stopper go straight away, then after two seconds, have it go back to its normal position. I'll have to do a little bit of testing about that. Either way though, I'm afraid I'm really out of time for today's episode, and if you have enjoyed, then of course, likes, favourites, shares, comments, all that good stuff, helps out me, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that From the Depths is a series you wish to see continued in the future. In the next episode, we'll be focusing on the Cram Cannon Tank and the Bloodthirst above all else, and we will be focusing on taking out some of the Onyx Watch's land. If we can get closer to their main base, or perhaps even take it, then it's definitely a huge success. I may spawn in a Bloodthirster to go north and attack the Onyx Watch as well, because that will just be a lot of fun. So thank you again for watching, and goodbye. Whee!